okay so this is uh, lecture what what's the number 17 okay at least some people are keeping track okay everybody is ready good so so i want to quickly summarize what we've been doing and then uh, get long i think there was some uh, notation and even in the definition there might have been some inconsistencies about what i called snr for qam and pam i want to just make sure we consistently define it then we'll proceed for okay so it's be a quick summary so so far we've been looking at ideal channels and hopefully uh, people would be comfortable uh, people would be comfortable uh, dealing with ideal channels okay so, so maybe it's useful to distinguish between two cases that we considered one case is base band pam okay and then we saw pass band we saw qam in the pass band right so pass band pam base band pam and uh, it's typical in this case in the ideal case to assume you have a bandwidth between minus w and w which is flat okay and you want to use this and uh, do your transmission Okay, so we found if the channel is ideal, one can eliminate ISI. Okay, so one can do your some filtering at the transmitter and careful filtering at the receiver and completely eliminate ISI by choosing your pulse shape to be what? Okay, so you avoid ISI by by choosing a Nyquist pulse shape. Okay, what do I mean by a Nyquist pulse shape? Okay, what's an example that you can take? Square root raise cosine. Okay, so you do that. Square root raise cosine is an example. And if you do that with say a roll off factor beta, you see that your symbol rate then becomes 1 by t equals 2w by 1 plus beta. Okay, for beta between 0 and 1. Okay, so this is your symbol rate. Okay, so what's the largest possible symbol rate? 2w okay so if you go in anything above 2w then you cannot avoid isi that's all i mean if you're willing to deal with isi you can go larger than that it's okay okay so but you can't avoid okay, so typically 2w is taken as the largest symbol right? nobody will exceed 2w okay so that's uh, that's what it means okay so when you do baseband pam okay your uh, your constellation has to be real right so you have a real constellation Okay, maybe I'll call it XR. Okay, to emphasize that, and so, so from here one can define what I'm going to call as, let's say, bits per dimension. Okay, so the reason is I want to keep this R as bits per dimension even when I go to QAM. Okay, so there I'll have to divide by two, right? So you'll have a complex constellation. So you'll have if you do log base two of size of the constellation, those, those that that many bits you send in two dimensions. Okay, to normalize everything, we'll say R is bits per dimension, in which case here it works out. So once you come up with this, you can also define very easily what the bit rate will be. Okay, so maybe RB, this is going to be log base 2 XR divided by T. If you want R by T, if you want, you can write it as 2W log base 2 size XR. Okay, so well that is r right divided by 1 plus beta okay so there's a closely related quantity called spectral efficiency which is defined as the actual bit rate divided by the amount of positive bandwidth that you're using okay so that's the spectral efficiency so you have bit rate r, rb here what is the positive bandwidth you're using w so you divide by this and you get your spectral efficiency okay so so maybe there's not too much room here so maybe i'll go to the next page and write down spectral efficiency for for baseband pam okay so typically it's denoted mu rb divided by w and it works out to 2 times log base 2 divided by 1 plus beta okay so as you increase your roll-off factor, what's happening to the spectral efficiency? 
it's going down and that's to be expected right so you're kind of wasting that roll of bandwidth no just for you're not using it for the symbol rate at all if you were to set beta equals 0 you're using all the bandwidth for uh, for your symbol rate in a way and that you get maximum spectral efficiency okay so that's uh, these are nice things to remember this is a very good uh, thing to keep in mind okay so when when you do most practical designs this is an equation you'll use all the time to determine your parameters okay so typically there will be a target bit rate and a given bandwidth okay so you divide rb by w you get your spectral efficiency and then from there you select a suitable beta and a size of your constellation okay so there might be multiple possibilities and you have to pick a nice thing which works out uh, works out for you all right so that's uh, i think there were a series of problems on this in the tutorial the solutions based on this and also even in the exam there was a question based on this and i think some people did not answer that question so maybe maybe you should be careful when you prepare for the exam the next time all right so so the last piece of uh, thing to tie it down is the snr calculation see all this is fine but ultimately of course i'm interested in probability of error versus eb over n0 right so that's my real goal that's that's complete that's what completely characterizes that so for that this snr in the waveform side we found to be equal to power divided by n0 w i did this computation and showed this will be equal to in the baseband case es by n0 by 2 okay right so there's a closely related quantity which is eb over n0 which works out for pam as snr divided by 2r okay so you can see all this will work out properly i did this computation uh, the last class okay so typically this eb over n0 is preferred to snr as the x axis the reason is it's normalized with respect to rate okay so you can compare bpsk to 16 pam or 32 pam in a fair way because you're normalizing with respect to rate, right? If somebody is doing 32 PAM, okay, and achieving a certain probability of error at a certain EB over N0, okay, it will seem like he needs a huge EB over N0, while somebody when he's doing BPSK, seems like he's needing a much lesser EB over N0, but, but not EB over N0, it's lesser SNR, okay? But that's because you're comparing two different things. Once you normalize with respect to rate, you'll see the EB over N0 will approximately be the same for both cases if you're achieving, if they're achieving similar points, okay? So it kind of get, gets rid of these kind of uh, differences in rate by normalizing. There's another way to normalize to SNR, which is the SNR norm. So instead of dividing by R, two times R, you divide by M squared minus one. That's also another way of doing it. And we saw that's a very good equalizer, right? Even for BPSK, as well as any large MPAM, you got very similar curves once you shifted to normalized SNR in the x-axis. Okay, so those, that's also a way to do it. But today, most people do EB over N0, and that's accepted. So you can do EB over N0 as well. All right, so that's the that's the that's the baseband uh, PAM. If there's any question that's disturbing people, it's a good time to ask. Any definition was not clear. Okay. All right, so if you want probability of error, there's an expression that you can do. If you restrict your constellation to MPAM, okay, so probability of error works out to, well, simple error works out to roughly, okay, two times Q. Okay, if you want to write it in terms of EB over N0, it will work out to 6 log M base 2 divided by M squared minus 1 EB over N0. Okay. So that's the formula. I think in terms of SNR, it works out to root 3 SNR by m squared minus 1, and all these things are things you can uh, quickly work out. All right, so that's uh, baseband PAM, and this much should be clear. So, given an ideal chunk of bandwidth in baseband, you should be able to actually design these things. Okay, so it's very easy to do. Very quickly, you can come up with the transmit filter and receive filter and quickly do it. It's no big deal. All right, so if you the another thing to keep in mind is the passpan QAM picture and it's very similar to this except that you'll you'll now deal with the the complex symbols okay so even in baseband PAM right I can think of my frequency W Hertz as a passband frequency with the center frequency of W by 2 okay so I could do if I wanted a passband modulation even with the baseband okay so but usually you'll see the spectral efficiencies will be okay you can as well do real symbols it will be okay okay so we'll see see the calculation one needs to be careful okay so what is the situation here here you have a frequency 
of W hertz available around the center frequency. Okay, so this is what is given to you. Okay, it's okay to deal with these two things as distinct quantities, but you should see the relationship between uh, pass band QAM and base band PAM. You'll see they are very closely related. At least in the ideal case, they are very similar. Okay, there's no problem. So instead of dealing with uh, pass band QAM, we typically do what? We do this down conversion and treat everything in as complex base band. Okay, so this becomes completely similar to a picture where you have a bandwidth of minus between minus W by 2 and W by 2, you shifted by FC, right? But then you have to imagine sending complex symbols, okay? Because when you move this out your transmits uh, spectrum need not be symmetric around 0. Okay? When you wanted real pair, uh, base band, it had to be symmetric around 0. Okay? So now you have, it need not be symmetric, so you can actually send uh, pass band, uh, I mean uh, non-symmetric thing which is complex. Okay? So now in this uh, complex base band picture, you can easily apply the avoiding ISI rule. Okay? So how do you avoid ISI? Once again by choosing Nyquist pulses which will give you W by 2 equals 1 plus beta by 2t where beta is the roll off factor. Okay. So your symbol rate becomes, okay, what does your symbol rate become? 1 by t becomes W by 1 plus beta. It seems to be half of the real case, real baseband case, but, but, but you are doing complex. So it is pretty much the other degree of freedom enters the picture and you get the same thing okay and uh, so this is a way of studying both together and people usually when you think of pass band QAM you think of a positive frequency of W Hertz and base band PAM think of once again a positive frequency of W Hertz but it works out differently the way you look at okay so this is the symbol red and this is uh, symbols per second okay so now you can do a similar calculation uh, with all the other things okay so you'll have a complex constellation say maybe chi c okay so from here if you want to go to r okay so this is going to give you an r which is half log base 2 mod chi c bits per what dimension okay you can also define a rate which is bits per symbol which would be what this factor of half will be gone okay it will be simply log base 2 okay so it depends on how you view it okay but usually since capacity is specified for bits per dimension it's it's better to do this for bits per dimension as well okay so that's the that's a nice thing to do okay so from here once one can easily go to the bit rate okay so the bit rate rb will work out as uh well i'll do the direct calculation okay. c divided by one plus beta okay so once again if you move to spectral efficiency okay mu which is again defined as rb by w here because amount of positive frequency has is still w okay so this works out to log base 2 size chi c plus 1 plus beta okay so artificially it looks like you have lost spectral efficiency okay but that's not true because typically everything else remaining the same if you can afford the same snr and all that you'll see size of chi c can be the square of size of chi r, okay, everything else being the same at the same point, you will you'll be able to afford that in QAM, okay. So, it is the same spectral efficiency both ways, okay. So, that is uh, that's a minor point. So, now if you do uh, SNR, I think here is where I might have been a little bit inconsistent in the way I defined SNR for PAM and QAM, okay. In the continuous case, you will get P by N naught W. This will work out to be ES by N naught, okay. So I might have defined ES by N naught by 2 as the SNR at some point, but I think we'll go back and revise it. I think ES by N naught is a better definition for QAM. Okay, so this will be the definition for uh, QAM because energy is over two dimensions, right? So noise also it's good to add up both the dimensions and make it N naught by 2 plus N naught by 2 in the denominator. Okay, so if you do this with your definitions, EB by N naught will still work out to SNR by 2R. Okay, so you can keep that normalization the same. Okay, right? So remember R you have to keep as bits per dimension. Okay, somewhere you have to take care of that half. It's just a some factor of two. Just be careful with these things so that 
we are consistent at least in this course okay all right so that's the snr definition and now we can do probability of error i think we i did it for m squared qam okay the probability of error will roughly be 4 times q okay so i think if you express it in terms of eb over n naught it will work out to something very similar to before okay m squared minus 1 uh, eb over n naught okay so i think these two are going to be uh, fairly similar all right so all right is that fine okay so these are all uh, trade offs you can do so suppose for instance you want to decide uh, you want a certain probability of error okay so you go back and figure out how much eb over n not you want from there you figure out what power you need what bandwidth you need from there then you go back and you know m also so you know what your spectral efficiency is all these things you can nicely compute with these simple expressions okay, so it's not a very difficult computation to do. okay so roll off also plays a very simple role okay so hopefully there are no questions uh, as far as uh, these things are concerned and uh, we can carry over okay any questions okay i know this is quiz week so presumably you're not spending any time looking at uh, 419 since the quiz is over okay so maybe maybe this is a time for you to think about all these things if you had any questions about how these things are defined it's a good time to ask okay all right so 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 all right so one more last thing last piece is to simply draw the whole picture and then uh, of the actual system and then we'll move on okay so we'll go go ahead and see uh, what else we want okay so once again i want to remind you of this picture because this picture is very important you can quickly forget it and uh, go through but that's it's probably not a very good idea okay so what's our uh, what's our modus operandi up to now okay so we have some bits we're going to do a mapping and convert it into a set of let me say complex symbols okay so i'll restrict myself to complex baseband uh, because that's general enough right there's no restriction complex baseband also includes real baseband and real passband okay so i'll restrict i'll always stick to complex baseband from now on okay so uh, I'm producing complex symbols, okay, and this goes through a transmit filter, okay. Then I do an up conversion, okay. It goes through my channel, noise gets added, and then I do a down conversion, and then I do a receive filter and sample okay once i do that what am i sure of okay sample at symbol rate right yes where There's some two i'm missing huh? it's dangerous man where am i missing a two uh I think there will be a d squared by 12 or something, no? Okay, so let's, uh, okay, so there's some dispute about the actual probability of error term I wrote down. So maybe we'll talk about it after class and just make sure we're on the right page on that. Okay. So there can be all factors of two all over the place. Okay, so I need to be careful. And uh, uh, there are ways of doing it to get rid of that. Okay. So this channel now is a passband channel right centered at the frequency in which you are up converting and down converting remember this is a symbol rate sampler okay what do i mean by symbol rate sampler you produce one sample per symbol okay so that's what you're doing and you know for sure that if you design your transmit filter and receive filter to avoid isi satisfying the nyquist criterion okay then what will happen this will be symbol plus noise <laughs> Okay, and then you do your detection. To produce estimates of bits. Okay, you produce bits hat. Okay, so this has been our picture so far. Okay, initially we started out by saying we'll occupy a very small bandwidth or increase our symbol rate so large so that what can be my transmit filter? 
simply a hold okay i don't have to do anything else in that case the receive filter will only be a integrate and dump it's a very simple design but the problem is you're not occupying all of the ideal bandwidth that you have so then we said we can in fact go further and further and we figured out what's the maximum symbol rate that you can use so that you still have no isi okay so you don't want one symbol to contribute to the sampling time see when you sample for the corresponding to a particular symbol you want no other symbol to contribute noise can contribute but you want no other symbol to contribute that was the definition of isi right so that's the that's something that we wanted and we saw we could do that only up to a certain symbol rate and then you do a roll off to adjust for certain uh, practical aspects there for the sync signal to die down fast and all that and those things will mean in practice some delays in the transmit filter some delays in the receive filter you have to account for all that all that is fine okay so you do all that finally you get symbol plus noise and you can detect all right so there's also a complex baseband view of this whole thing okay so this whole up conversion down conversion instead of viewing it in this form okay one can view it equivalently as simply a complex baseband channel okay so this channel is going to be complex but it will be baseband okay so in this class i never did uh, the baseband equivalent for noise okay so it turns out you can do a very similar baseband equivalence even for noise okay noise in the band one can do it so this noise also i can think of as complex noise in baseband okay so there is something i'm, I'm not going to do it and it's not too important because once you filter and sample it's easy to picture it but uh, this, with, within this picture one can also imagine noise and then everything becomes baseband for you there's no pass band and from now on i'll happily only consider complex baseband okay so in this complex channel the frequency frequency response i mean the chan the impulse response is complex which means there is no symmetry around zero in the amplitude okay it can have uh, asymmetry but still it's okay all right so this is the equivalent that we will be looking at okay so this receive filter okay so plays a crucial role okay so uh the way we the way i justified it or introduced it is what by saying i'm projecting onto the orthogonal signal space okay so as we go along there will be several heuristic interpretations for these receive filters okay so one one heuristic interpretation is to say this filter rejects out of band noise okay which is something that you have to do so noise itself will occupy a huge bandwidth and you don't want to incur all of that so it it uh, rejects out of band noise so in some systems you might even have a low pass filter before this receive filter okay which rejects everything that is out of the band okay so that's a, that's one thing to keep in mind so there are several interpretations for this one of them is that this filter rejects out of band noise another interpretation is that it provides some symbol rate statistics for you to do detection right after this receive filter you only have symbol rate statistics what do we mean by symbol rate statistics you get one value per symbol and that is enough for your detection in the ideal case okay so we'll later on maybe we'll see something non ideal something approximate even there we will use some approximations like that so so one more one more uh, heuristic interpretation for the receive filter is people will say it maximizes the snr at that time when you sample okay so people will design the receive filter so that some snr maximization happens so all these things are very heuristic simple ways of thinking about the receive filter so you might have a receive filter in future for rejecting out of band noise or maximizing snr at the time when we, when you sample okay so those are all heuristic interpretations which have a lot of meaning you'll see when you read books several books talk about these kind of things and this nice ways of understanding what the receive filter is doing okay but theoretically the good way of viewing it is it's doing correlations and producing correlated outputs which are important for your detector okay so that's how that's how you view it theoretically okay so any questions on this picture okay was this an important picture okay was if at all you are actually implementing a communication system you have to think of these blocks in this fashion okay so it's very it's very important that you understand this picture you know so many elements here all the assumptions of this picture okay the coherent assumption of fc being available exactly the timing assumption of capital t being known exactly okay so if you're familiar with these circuits oscillators are never stable the temperature changes the oscillator changes right so many things changes okay so many things change 
So one needs to be careful about these assumptions. So in practice, there'll be lots of circuits around these things to fix these problems. Okay, so you should anticipate those problems as well. Okay, so I think uh, we have to move ahead. And moving ahead, we're going to now slowly relax the assumption of. Uh, so that's summary. Okay, so that's what we did so far. So to moving ahead, we're going to relax the assumption of what? What is the assumption that we will relax? I'm sorry. Ideal channel assumption. Okay, so we're going to relax the ideal channel assumption. Okay, so that's what we'll do. So first question you might ask is why would you ever want to do something like that? Why can't we just sit inside a ideal uh, flat channel? In fact, maybe it's possible to view any spectrum as several parallel channels of small small bandwidth each where it's ideal. In fact, that's done today. People view it that way also. But uh, initially, we're going to see what what do you do if the channel is not ideal? Okay, so that's a that's a good thing to study as well. And in that case, we'll see you can't avoid ISI. So you'll have ISI and you have to deal with ISI. Okay, so this is what's coming further ahead. Okay, uh, non-ideal channels. Okay, which means ISI. Okay. Okay, so we still want to do symbol rate statistics. Okay, we still want to have only one sample per symbol and all that, and then we'll deal with ISA in a different way. So you see, there's so many, there are so many heuristic ideas here now. Okay, so if you want to do the optimal thing with ISA, it's very difficult. Usually, you write down the whole thing, it becomes very painful. There's no intuition, and you can't start building things immediately. Okay, to be able to build, we'll do a lot of heuristics. We'll say, okay, this seems like an interesting thing to try. So what is it need? What is needed there? Okay, eventually, I'll also show. That one such construction is optimal, okay. But uh, but for now, we'll just simply build on some some simple heuristics and try to come up with some receiver structure which you know we can build, okay. At least, and at some level of assumptions we, which we know we can build, and then we'll study its properties more and more and maybe simplify it to get it to a very practical level, okay. So that's my approach. There are several different approaches for dealing with ISI channels. My approach is going to be try try to get some system which you can build, okay. And then study its properties, or maybe study its optimality, extra, extra. Okay, so that's how uh, I'm going to approach this. Okay, so I'll closely follow section 5.4 in Barry Lee and Mr. Schmidt for this. Okay, so for a, in this lecture and maybe the next one, we will follow section 5.4. So if you have the book, uh, you should probably go and uh, take a look at it. Okay. So what's our picture now? Okay, so what what does our picture become? When I said non-ideal channels, what does what does it become? So you still have bits, okay, and I'm still going to map, okay. So I'm going to still do a mapping to some constellation, okay, to produce a set of symbols, okay. So I'll call it S, which is say S0 through S L minus one. Each of this is a complex valued symbol okay so i'm still going to think of it that way sometimes instead of thinking of it as a vector i'll think of it as a discrete time complex signal okay in that case my notation for this will become sk okay so that's a standard uh, notation there okay and I'm, I'm still going to do a transmit filter here okay i'll say my transmit filter impulse response is some g of t Okay, so when I do that, my signal is going to become S of t equals what summation k equals zero to l minus one what s k g of t minus k t. Okay, remember uh, that was my picture. I'm going to think of the symbol sequence as a impulse sequence, and then I'm going to convolve with g of t. So everything will become like this. Okay, capital T is my symbol time. Okay, so one by t is the symbol rate. Okay, so 1 by t is the symbol rate. All right. So, so you might choose g of t using various considerations. Maybe you can still choose it to be a square root raised cosine. Okay, it's okay. All right. So, but what's going to happen now? My channel is going to do something to each of these things. Okay, maybe my channel response is c of t. Okay, remember this is complex baseband. Okay, c of t is going to be complex. But its frequency is going to be in baseband. Okay, frequency spectrum is going to be in baseband. And then you have noise added to it. 
and you have to process this in base band remember there's an up conversion and a down conversion which i'm swallowing into a complex base band channel and the complex base band equivalent of noise okay so i'm doing all of that okay so this r of t is going to become okay so you have to convolve s of t with c of t and there is a delay and you can also incorporate that delay very easily and ultimately you will get an expression of this form okay k equals 0 to l minus 1 sk h of t minus kt okay plus and t what is this h of t what will this h of t be yeah g of t convolved with c of t okay so that's what it's going to be okay so h of t is g of t convolved with c of t okay so it's the same picture okay right g of t and c of t are occurring in sequence obviously in series so you, have, you can look at it as convolved and one thing happened so far the way we chose g of t we were able to assume that what h of t was equal to g of t itself in that way c of t was ideal we restricted ourselves in that band okay so maybe now you want to increase that and allow for h of t to be different from g of t okay so that's the basic issue here okay so right now i'm not i'm no longer guaranteed h of t is uh, same as g of t when i know when i know it is same as g of t i am in this simple uh, i know the orthonormal basis okay then i can happily project onto the orthonormal basis i won't lose anything there's no problem but when i don't know that i have to do something else okay so i cannot do the same as what i had before and you have you will have isi in in any configuration when you see when it when you when I, I i'll consider several configurations from now on and whenever i do sampling at symbol rate i will see in several of those configurations i will have isi okay so each each sample will not correspond to only one symbol multiple symbols will play a role okay so i haven't come to that yet is, is there a question yeah but the point is you don't know h of t right you don't know you cannot control h of t okay well c of t okay okay so let me be careful okay so right now uh, so okay so you're saying design g of t so that h of t becomes orthonormal h of t and h of t minus kt become orthonormal yeah that could be a way of doing things okay but but that will be slightly impractical in the sense that then you can't build a transmitter which works for different channels you'll have to do something more right so if you want to just take the transmitter and plug it into another channel maybe you have to do some more training there and then the filter will change it, it might be possible i'm not saying no actually today's system are adaptable in that way but i want to consider a situation where you don't want to alter your gft too much and you want to deal with any c of t that might be there okay that's one issue other issue is even when you have a fixed channel with time things will change okay tomorrow the temperature might be a little bit higher okay so because of that something else might do some some non linearity or some such thing and your channel might slightly change okay somebody might might be doing something else so you know things change like that and you don't want to hang your entire design on the fact that g of t convolved with c of t is still going to give me a nyquist pulse okay i don't know for sure okay and so many things have to change okay not only g of t right if c of t changes h of t changes which means your which means your match filter here will have to change when I mean, you can't tie it to one specific h of t very easily okay, so those are practical issues which you might have to deal with so maybe it's a good idea to do something else but having said that my first configuration is going to assume i know h of t at the receiver okay at the receiver not at the transmitter okay just at the receiver okay so in that case you can't really go back and adjust your g of t okay you have to live with whatever you got at the receiver okay so that's the those are the kind of assumptions that we'll make to make it more practical all right so i have to figure out what to do here okay i don't know what to do here but i know what i want out of it what do i want out of it i want s hat okay an estimate for my symbol sequence or s hat of k okay that's what i want okay so so like i said we are going to consider simple heuristic approaches to come up with something that we can build and then we'll study how optimal it is okay so one can obviously take this problem in its full generality and do the theoretical derivation of what the optimal receiver is and i'm sure there are good books which do that i'm sure there are good people who can do that but i'm going to take a simple approach and come up with some i'm going to follow what barry lee and mr smith do it's a simple approach and i like that because it introduces a lot of nice ideas at the right time okay so so what are we going to do okay so here is a principle that i'm going to use okay i have r of t which contains information about 
L symbols which have collected into a vector S. Okay. I'm going to simply take. So first thing is I'm going to assume that H of t is known at the receiver. Okay. So it's known at the receiver, and I'm going to define some kind of a minimum distance criteria between R of t and a possible S of t, and then pick based on that. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do, and that's uh, it turns out to have a lot of general principles in it. Okay. So here's the heuristic minimum distance receiver. Okay, so what am I going to do? It works in this principle S hat. It will set to be equal to argument of the minimum of a belonging to chi power l. What do I mean by chi power l? Uh, vectors of length l with components from this chi. Okay, as x script x. Okay, so basically vectors of length l from my alphabet, okay, from my constellation. Okay, so that's uh, the thing. Okay. What am I going to do? I'm going to minimize some distance between R of t and. Okay, remember I know h, so I'm going to say I'm going to minimize distance between this and summation small l equals zero to l minus one a sub l h of t minus k t uh, l t. I'm sorry. Okay, so maybe I'll just use k. I want to be careful here. Okay. All right. Some kind of distance. Okay. So I have to define distance between two continuous time signals, right? So R of t, which is the signal I got, and some signal that I have to generate. So how many such signals do I have to generate? Sorry, mod chi, mod x power l. Okay, so if you are looking at say 16 qam and l equals 10, okay, this becomes huge. Okay, so or if even if l becomes 1000, it becomes really huge. Okay, so it's slightly impractical in that respect. Maybe we'll make it more practical as we go along. But I don't want to worry about it. At least from a conceptual point of view, I want to be able to do it. Okay, so one thing. You might say, okay, well, well, this looks very optimal to me. Okay, right? <laughs> so some distance you define, but I have not done that yet. Okay, so how, how do I go to an optimal receiver? I have to start with something. I have to start with probability of error. Okay, and then minimizing the probability of error. Okay, that's how you do the optimality part. Okay, I have not done done any MAP or ML or anything. Okay, I have not done anything. I've just come to the distance directly. Okay, so I don't know if it's optimal or not, but at least it gives me a nice way of writing something down and thinking about the decoding. Okay, otherwise it'll just Keep going round and round, it's not very easy. Okay, so right now it doesn't seem that practical, but at least it seems like a good start. Okay, and notice I'm assuming H of t is known. Okay, right? If it's not known, at the receiver, transmitter need not know it, but the receiver has to know it. Okay, all right. So this this guy, this distance, I will call it as some metric, which I will say j sub a. Okay, well it will be the L2 distance between. These two waveforms. What will be the L2 distance? Integral from minus infinity to infinity, modulus r of t minus summation k equals zero to capital L minus one. Okay, a k. So I should be careful how I write a k, right? So I'll write a k here. H of t minus k t. Okay, mod square d t. Okay, so remember once again I should write a k carefully. So I'm thinking of it as a vector, but also it is a symbol sequence, as in it's a signal. Okay. So remember, R of t is complex. Okay. The a k's are complex. H of t is also complex. I mean, all these things are complex quantities. So when I take the modulus, it's really a modulus of a complex number. Okay. So it's not just absolute value of positive. Okay. So we'll start with this and write down. Is there a question? I'm sorry. Which one? J A is a number. It's actually a real number. J A is a real number. What's inside the the modulus? What's inside the modulus is a continuous time signal. Continuous time complex signal. Is there a question? R of t is a continuous time complex signal. What do you mean by complex signal? Basically, you have two wires, and both signals matter to you: the real part and the imaginary part. It's got a I channel and a Q channel. Okay, what you get on the I channel, what you get on the Q channel, 
you do that plus j this, you get the complex baseband equal. What's the question? Which is a vector? There's no vector. A is a complex vector. You can think of A as a complex vector if you want. But I'm also saying that as a discrete time complex signal. Okay. So once you do this substitution, this will, this, these two will actually be, this will be a complex continuous time signal. Okay. So I mean, don't worry about how to evaluate these things. No, I mean, just let's write it down. Eventually, when you simplify, we'll come up with the discrete time version of the evaluation. Okay. You're not going to definitely evaluate this in continuous time. It's very difficult to make it work in continuous time. Okay. So we, we will come up with some symbol rate evaluations in discrete time. Okay, so that's the it's just a start. I want to show that we can do it slowly. Okay, surely you don't want to try and implement this. Maybe you can try. I don't know. Today's technology goes in crazy ways. Okay, so you can't predict it. Maybe you'll sample it, totally over sample it some hundred times and then try to implement it. I don't know. That sounds like a bad idea. Okay, so now. Uh, how do we write mod square for a complex number? For each t, it's actually a complex number. So how do you write mod square? Number times number conjugate. And we have to do a series of simplifications, which I'm going to try and quickly do and cut through and finally write the final answer. Okay, so <laughs> I, have to, I can write it down slowly, but it's just uh, it's too painful and it's not really very illustrative. But the final expression is very important. Okay, so you do that, you'll get this. You'll get this. The first term will be mod r of t squared dt okay what is this this is like the energy in r of t okay so you can see why it comes right r of t minus this times its conjugate so the first term will be mod r of t squared the next term the middle terms the mixed terms you can join together and write it as two times real part okay so if you're used to this you'll see where it comes from minus two times real part of okay i'll push the summation outside of the integral Okay, summation k equals 0 to l minus 1, a k star, k star k, integral minus infinity to infinity, r of t, h star of t minus k t, dt. Okay, so this whole thing is inside the summation okay how did i get two times real part you'll, you'll see you'll get this whatever is inside plus its conjugate okay so that will become two times real part okay of one of those things and i'm choosing this you can choose the other one also i'm choosing this for convenience okay and then the last term will be product of two summations and then an integral i can again pull the summations out and carefully rewrite the integral to get this form okay so whenever you do this you have to use two different dummy variables okay these are all standard things which you might be familiar with from a long time of doing these kind of computations okay ak aj star okay and then what you have inside will be a integral from minus infinity to infinity h of t minus kt times h star of t minus j capital t dt and that's it Okay, so this whole thing is inside the summation. Okay, so I know I didn't prove it line by line, but this will work out to be the same thing. Okay, so now the so you see what's the point? Now this is a better form than the first form I had. Okay, why? Because well, there is summations at symbol rates outside, and then what's inside is it's almost like a filtering. Okay, right? You're, it's almost like filtering of r of t and h of t right integral minus infinity infinity r of t h star of t minus kt is nothing to be very scared about it's an integration it's a filter followed by a symbol rate sampler same thing is happening with h okay so you see already it's becoming better okay so you can quickly transition from the continuous time into a symbol rate sampled version just by doing this simple uh, thing okay so there are several uh, crucial interchange of summation and integration and how all that worked out is fairly important okay so so what do we do next next we try to write down those symbol rate samplers and filters separately and separately and then try to rewrite this expression okay so that's what we're going to try next and i have about five minutes i'm going to quickly take it up okay so the first thing i'm going to define is a signal y of k which is 
integral minus infinity to infinity r of t h star of t minus k t dt. It's clear why I am defining it. Okay, so you take r of t, you filter with h star of minus t, and do a simple rate sampler. Simple rate sampler, you'll get y k. Okay, so it's a discrete time signal. The other thing is what I'm going to call rho h k, which is kind of like a sample dot correlation of h of t integral minus infinity to infinity h of t h star of t minus k t. Remember, all of these guys can be complex. Okay. So once I do these two definitions, you see I can quickly write J A in this form. Okay. The first term I will write as E R. What is E R? It's energy in R. Okay. So fill in what this is. It's a very simple expression, and I don't have to worry so much about that first term because yeah, it's independent of A. Okay. So I don't have to worry too much about those kind of terms. And the next term is two times real part of summation k equals 0 to l minus 1 ak star yk okay and then the last term is a double summation k equals 0 to l minus 1 j equals 0 to capital l minus 1 ak aj star rho h of j minus k okay check that this is this matches with the previous thing. It's easy to do it. It will be, uh, I mean, the j minus k, the reason it comes is the way I refined rho h of k is h of t, h star of t minus kt. There I had h of t minus kt and h star of t minus jt. So the difference is what matters. You will get you will get a j minus k from there. Okay. So that's your, uh, that's your j a expression. Okay. So already, I think many of us will agree that it's beginning to look better. Okay. Maybe not all that better, but it's beginning to look better than what we had before okay <clears throat> so now uh, so about uh, two or three minutes left uh, so what can we calculate at the receiver how do we go about calculating it rho h of k assuming i know h of t can be pre-computed right what type of a signal will rho h of k be okay so it will be actually an autocorrelation function Right? It is an autocorrelation function, sampling of an autocorrelation function of h of t. Okay, so so that's one property you know about rho h. So what will happen if I do a Fourier trans discrete time Fourier transform of rho h of k? I'll get a non-negative real valued discrete time Fourier transform. Okay, so all those things you know about rho h. How will you find y k? Okay, so how do you find y k? You take r of t and then match filter with yeah, basically filter with h star of minus t, which is the match filter corresponding to h of t, not g of t, okay? It's g of t convolved with c of t, okay? So match filter corresponding to h of t, and then what do you do? You do a symbol rate sampling, and you get y k, okay? Right? So this is what we write down in theory. In, in practice, there will be a t equals k t plus delta. What is the delta coming from? All the delays you have to incorporate. Okay, so there'll be some delays. I mean, your filter will delay, uh, channel will delay. There'll be so many delays from all over the place. Okay, so channel phase response will never be zero. It'll be a some delay factor. So all these things will happen. So you have to adjust for all these things. In practice, there will be a delta. In theory, when I write it down, I'm just going to write it as kt, assuming that the delay has been swallowed in the model and in the adjustments. Okay, so for those of you who are doing 471, when you actually implement this, these delays will be important. Okay, so you'll have to adjust for those delays, maybe even manually. Okay, so all these things you'll have to do. Okay, so pay attention to this. When I write down some things like this, it's not just KT, it's there is a delay. Okay. Uh, okay, so you do that, you get YK. Okay, so Y of K can be easily computed at the receiver. Assuming H star of minus T is an implementable filter. Okay, even if it is not implementable, see you can expect it to be causal, right? So H star of minus T, maybe it's going to be anti causal. Okay, so how do you do it? You delay, okay, but it's going to be finite energy and all that because it's a real channel, so it has to be finite energy and all that. So it will be an implementable filter, it won't be too bad, okay. So if you know it, you can implement it, okay. So y of k can be found, and I'll talk more about rho h of k in the next class. It's more important, it's very important that you understand rho h of k much more than y k, seems like a simple thing, okay. So we'll see that in more detail in the next class, okay. Are there any questions about how I wrote this down, okay?
So remember, once again, it's a heuristic condition. I've not justified it rigorously based on optimality. Later on, we'll see there is an optimal structure which is very similar to this. Okay, so but it's a, this is a heuristic to get started about and how to think of your receiver and all. Okay. Right.